Thanks, everyone. Now, I know a lot of you think of NASA. We're most known for putting satellites into space or throwing space shuttles up, or NASA's current uh, mission is putting someone uh, or flying someone to Mars. Uh, which they have to do in the next uh, decade or two. But they also do a lot of work on uh, Earth science as well. And I'm actually in the Earth Science Office at Marshall Space Flight Center, which is in Huntsville, Alabama. And through this office, we do a lot of things involving um, weather and climate. Oftentimes, it's monitoring weather or monitoring climate or monitoring Earth processes, uh, generally using satellites or transitioning that data into useful products and so forth. But a big part of what we also do is health work, at, uh, specifically at Marshall. And a lot of it involves air quality, um, uh, heat-related deaths and heat mortality, um, but also we're starting to do some infectious disease work as well, and that's generally where my background is. So this lecture is going to be less mathematical and more about uh, ways that weather and climate uh, infect, oh, sorry, affect infectious diseases specifically, and, and how you have to use those things when you, when you create your models. And of course, when you create a process-based model, you're forced to think of these things. You have to think of each process uh, from the virus or pathogen, it could be a virus, bacteria, when that starts to when it infects someone and how that cycle continues. However, a lot of statistical-based models, which are often used, you don't necessarily have to think of those processes. And that can lead to a lot of problems, especially when people have uh, a bunch of data. It could be climate data. It's usually some kind of climate data like temperature, and they also have some death data related to any specific disease or cause. And they just take all that data, they throw it into a statistical model, maybe do a linear regression, and they come up with this curve, and all of a sudden they publish a paper on it. Or at least that paper goes out to review. And I'm going to tell you that almost every review I get for a paper that I end up having to reject or that ends up getting rejected is because someone did that. They took some data they had, they knew some kind of statistical process. Oftentimes these statistical methods are easy to do because we have packages that make them so easy to do. And they throw it in without any thought of the processes. And that can lead to really erroneous c conclusions. And, uh, and that's generally what leads to um, rejection by papers. It becomes very apparent early on that the person didn't understand the life cycle of the pathogen or the, the disease or health issue that, uh, that they were um, writing about. So the motivation for, I think, a lot of this, uh, this workshop is climate, climate change and global change in general. And it makes sense. Almost all models show, uh, well, observations and models show an increase in temperature. Uh, this is from um, the IPCC. Uh, report in 2013. It definitely shows the observations increasing uh, from the 1950s up to the present, and then almost all models uh, showing a uh, future increase all the way up to, I think they run the models all the way up to 2200 now, or 2199, and almost all of them show uh, increasing temperatures. Now there's a lot of variability in how hot or how warm it's going to be, and not all places are supposed to warm at the same rate. There are locations where we actually see some cooling uh, in the next 10 to 20 years, but by about 2100, almost every model in every location shows um, a good deal of warming. And that matters because we're not just pushing the average over. Uh, if you look at temperature here, we're not just pushing the average over. We're also increasing the variance as well. And this makes a big difference because you're not only increasing the, your extreme conditions by a little bit, you're increasing by a lot. Because you're not only shifting the, uh, the mean, but you're also um, pushing it down as well. So you're increasing the variance. So we see a lot of extreme conditions, both for temperature uh, and precipitation and other variables as well. And that has, obviously, implications for diseases. So these are deaths, estimated deaths from climate change. Now, of course, this is very difficult to estimate. These are based on um, a lot of different numbers. I'm not actually sure how the World Health Organization came up with these numbers. Uh, as you can see, Africa is uh, greatly affected by it. And a lot of the main polluting countries, which include the United States and a lot of these European countries, actually have the lowest burden, which is uh, somewhat ironic that the um, countries <coughs> contributing the most to global change and warming show the least amount of what deaths. What are the circles in the ocean? What was that? What are the circles in the ocean? Oh, I think these are, are supposed to represent um, probably islands. Yeah. What was that? These are just estimated deaths from climate change, so it's hard to tell. So sometimes they look. What was that? Deaths caused from things they attribute to climate change. It could be heat-related deaths, infectious disease, um, it could be even malnutrition. So these are very, that's why these numbers are huge estimates. It's really hard to tell exactly. Uh, you have to kind of choose your parameters and, and so forth. So there are estimates, and I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't claim. I mean, you can see this huge 80 to 120 million. That's a, a big range in there. What was that? Should they represent yearly deaths or total deaths? Oh, no, these are total deaths, I believe. Totally, not per year. That would be, yeah, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so there's many ways that climate and weather can affect uh, human health. There's some very direct method, uh, sorry, sorry, direct methods, uh, such as temperature extremes. So we know heat waves often attributed with uh, death, especially from cardiovascular and respiratory conditions. Oftentimes, these are people who are already um, uh, have an existing health condition, and the warming temperatures just kind of pushes them over the edge. But we also know very healthy people can be affected by this as well. And you often see this with athletes often when they're in, uh, during the summertime when they're training under extreme conditions. Sometimes they don't drink enough water or they just overheat. And so you can get deaths from extremely healthy people as well. What's kind of the most popular or exciting is kind of extreme weather. People think of flooding events, hurricanes, tornadoes, that type of thing. That's a fairly direct effect. Uh, Air quality is actually something that's studied at NASA quite a bit. And this includes things like pollen in the air, which can exacerbate um, uh, people with asthma and allergies, and this can cause respiratory conditions. Uh, ozone's another one. Uh, it's, very, it's obviously good for us in the stratosphere because it protects us from UV radiations, but at the um, ground level, ozone is uh, not so good for our, our lungs. And then particulate matter as well is also, uh, can, hurt, uh, can exacerbate any kind of respiratory condition. But today I'm going to focus mostly on pathogens, um, mostly, uh, well, quite a few of them, vector-borne, rodent-borne, water-borne, soil-borne, and air-borne. I'm going to go ahead and go through a couple of examples of each. So this is kind of just another uh, diagram showing pathways to how climate and weather can affect um, health or infectious disease. And it includes all types of things. So we talked about, I already talked about vector-borne. Um, uh, waterborne allergies, so forth, but also things like environmental refugees, uh, forest migration. Uh, we didn't talk about mental health, but there are people who can cause um, specific type of um, conditions uh, like uh, depression from the conditions outside. Malnutrition is, is a really important one because malnutrition obviously is an important is uh, obviously uh, detrimental to your health if you're not getting enough nutrients, but can also make you available um, or more susceptible to other infectious diseases as well. And of course, I talked again about. Uh, heat stress and cardiovascular diseases as well. So uh, this was kind of mentioned in the last talk, but it's important to recognize uh, where risk and vulnerability, where that actually comes from. And, and risk and vulnerability are, are uh, functions of exposure, uh, sensitivity, and your adaptive capacity. So we think of something um, uh, like heat-related mortality. So heat could be an environmental stress, like there are really warm conditions outside. And some people are more sensitive this to others. So if you're a construction worker who has to work outside in these conditions, you're more sensitive. If you're someone who has an existing cardiovascular condition, you're also more sensitive uh, to the disease. Versus if you're working in an office that's air conditioning, you might not be as sensitive to disease. The exposure exists out there, but you're not going to be very sensitive to it. Um, uh, there's also then the adaptive capacity, so how we can deal with it. So if you're healthy or you have conditions where you, know, you can stay hydrated and you can go into cooler environments, you're able to adapt to that, um, that stressor a lot better than someone who maybe uh, is constantly exposed to it because um, they don't have air conditioning. And a lot of places in uh, Arizona, which is a very hot place in the, um, in the United States, uh, a lot of the poor population who don't have, who don't have air conditioning, uh, oftentimes you see deaths increase quite a bit amongst them. Uh, versus people who are wealthier, you see the deaths during heat-related um, uh, heat conditions, high heat conditions, they're not as, um, they're not as high. And uh, kind of the background, I think all of this is interdisciplinary research because diseases kind of, they sit at this uh, intersection between human systems and uh, natural systems. And because of that, we need a lot of different types of researchers to be conducting this work. So I'm going to think of people in social sciences, uh, think a lot about this, who's vulnerable, why are they vulnerable, how do we how do we um, uh, solve vulnerability? Um, epidemiologists talking about how people get infected and so forth and statistics. Uh, then you kind of get into a little bit more of the harder sciences, uh, like in the biologies, where you're talking about um, the ecology of a vector or the, how the pathogen reacts to either kind of vaccines or how it responds to uh, environmental conditions. And then, of course, in the essence of climate change, you're talking about uh, climate and weather. So you're talking about meteorologists and climatologists who are looking at not only what the conditions like right now, but how can we forecast them into the future. So we have this thing called the epidemiological triangle of disease. Uh, it can also be thought of more as a pyramid, too, depending on the disease. But it basically shows you that there's a relationship between the pathogen, uh, a host. A uh, host could be human or lots of diseases affect livestock that are very important in the environment. 
And in some cases, you also have a uh, reservoir or vector as well. So in the case of um, something like malaria, you have the host uh, being oftentimes humans, uh, the pathogen being uh, plasmodium. You have the environment which affects both the pathogen developed in the, mos in the, uh, mosqui in the mosquito, um, and then also the mosquito itself, which interacts with both uh, the person by biting them, uh, the pathogen, because the uh, mosquito is transmitting the pathogen, and then the environment as well, because obviously uh, environmental conditions affect uh, the mosquito population as well. And this could be not just mosquitoes, but uh, West Nile virus is, um, it affects humans, but it's also carried by birds. So in this case, what's happening in the bird population is also important. So we have to understand the ecology whenever we create a model. We have to know, are we looking at just um, a vector and a, um, and a human population? Usually that's not the case. There's a pathogen in between there. Um, and also, are humans the main source of a, of a pathogen? So something like dengue fever or malaria is actually a little bit easier to model because we have the pathogen is either in a vector population or it's in the human population. That's really about it. Something like West Nile virus is also in the bird population. It's possible for West Nile virus to exist in a community uh, even if there's no birds infected, oh, sorry, if there's no um, humans infected. So it, it's a little bit difficult to monitor. You can't just monitor the humans or just the mosquitoes. The birds are very important as well. Uh, so we look at kind of four uh, examples of ecologies. We have anthropoenoses, which are uh, diseases that are uh, native to humans. Uh, and think of something like TB and measles, where it's just human to human contact. Uh, same thing uh, kind of with like influenza for uh, this is a little bit more tricky, but you think of it's just human contacts, another human, and they transmit the pathogen. It's a fairly simple ecology. We can think of indirect transmission where the uh, humans are still the, uh, the main host of the uh, virus, but um, there's a different vehicle. It's not just spread person to person. And this is an example is like I said, malaria or dengue fever where uh, you spread it from human to human, but it's spread uh, through the bite of an infected mosquito. Now you have these diseases that are generally in the animal population of some sort, but once in a while spill over into the human population. An example of this would be rabies uh, in the case of animal-to-animal uh, -animal contact. And this is uh, an example of rabies is generally, depending on where you are, it's generally transmitted between you know, um, two types, two mammals. In the United States, uh, a lot of places are raccoons or, um, or bats in some cases, but that's generally it. It very rarely infects humans, but once in a while, a uh, an animal will attack a human, and that human will uh, contract rabies. Uh, generally, that human doesn't contribute to the uh, rest of the cycle of, of rabies. Uh, you rarely ever hear of incidents where a human then goes and attacks another human and uh, gives it back to them, or to another animal in general. So humans in there are considered kind of dead and host. They get the disease once in a while, and that's the end of it. And that also exists on vector-borne diseases as well. And you could think of something uh, like this as a... Um, um, uh, that's not, those aren't actually the right examples I was looking for, but um, like West Nile virus, where um, it's generally uh, birds um, are the uh, reservoirs for the virus, and mosquitoes transmit it back and forth between birds. And then once in a while, after biting an infected um, bird, that mosquito will then bite a human and transfer it to humans. So these are very different ecologies, and so when you make any kind of model, whether it's a statistical or process-based model, you have to think about what the ecology is like before you can decide, okay, what factors do I want to include in the model, and what processes do I need to study, and what kind of parameters do I need to, um, do I need to find. Uh, so I'm going to go a little bit into how climate and weather can affect different parts of um, pathogen ecology, uh, including temperature. Things like the mean temperature makes a difference. You often see people use the minimum maximum temperature, and also sometimes you see a range of temperature. This could be a daily range in temperature, or maybe an annual range in temperature. Precipitation matters, not just the total precipitation in, let's say, a month, but it could mean in that month how many days have precipitation, and does that precipitation happen in you know, one, two, three, four days in a row, or does it happen one day, then you don't have anything for a week, and then it happens another day? So those intervals between precipitation can also be important. Humidity is important. The two biggest measures you see is um, uh, specific and relative humidity. These are different measures. So specific humidity is an absolute measure of humidity, versus relative humidity is uh, it's relative to the amount of um, water, that the water vapor that could exist in the air. So they're two slightly different measures. Wind can matter, both wind speed and uh, variability. Um, things like surface pressure and uh, ENSO, which stands for the El Nino Southern Oscillation. If you've done any kind of climate or um, meteorological work, you've probably uh, 
heard of El Nino uh, in some way. And then, of course, climate change. And also to talk a little about the scale of how, how scale of responses to these things. So both a temporal scale, what does it mean to have you know, a really high temperature on one day versus high temperatures for a week versus you know, climate change. Those all operate on different scales and they're going to affect uh, pathogens uh, differently because of that. Uh, also, lags are an important thing to consider too. So you know, if you have a high temperature or you have a bunch of rainfall on one day, it doesn't mean you're going to have mosquitoes the next day. It takes time for the mosquito population to build up and, and, and develop and go through its uh, life cycle. So lags are also important. And then we'll talk about spatial scale a little bit, uh, a little bit too, which is important when you just kind of select what kind of uh, meteorological or climate data you're going to use for your study. So temperature effects on pathogenic holly uh, can do a few things. So um, pathogen uh, can, uh, temperature can affect pathogen uh, growth, survival, or incubation periods. And this is just an example of some uh, types of bacteria and their, uh, their growth rates. Now, these aren't in absolute numbers. This is just kind of a... Um, to give you an idea. But then you see that most bacteria, uh, their growth rates increase with temperature up to a certain point, and then uh, they kind of usually fall a little bit more quickly, especially at very high temperatures. So that makes a difference. If you know, it's 10 degrees Celsius, uh, and most of the mesophiles, these are usually um, bacteria that cause human disease, 10 degrees Celsius, you're not going to get much growth, and therefore it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to transmit this type of bacteria. Temperature also affects, affects vector dynamics. So if you have a vector-borne disease, uh, like ticks or mosquitoes, their life cycle is often um, uh, affected by temperature or determined by temperatures during the season. So we have this kind of case. Uh, here's kind of just a basic one for ticks. Uh, it's about a two-year life cycle from hatching all the way until when the adults will relay eggs. And during uh, winters that are exceptionally mild in some places, this cycle can continue here instead of going dormant, so you can have um, more cycles in a particular year and everything, and more ticks. And generally, when you get those high population of ticks, you increase your probability of, um, of disease. Another thing to think about is kind of the human responses to temperature as well. And this occurs in a lot of places in the US uh, that you normally wouldn't think of having vector-borne diseases. So in Connecticut is an area in the US that has uh, very high economic standards. And there's kind of this um, uh, thought by a lot of people that a lot of people in the U.S. especially, that we're a rich country, we, we're not susceptible to vector-borne diseases. That's just the way it is. We spend so much time inside, we have good health, all kinds of stuff. And that's really untrue. And you think of Lyme, Connecticut, which is one of the richest counties in America, is the place where Lyme disease was named because they had so many children getting rheumatoid arthritis, which was one of the symptoms of it. And it's because during nice days, especially in the spring, summer, fall, people like to go out hiking. And this is true of people who are in low economic status all the way to very high economic status. And when you go out walking in fields uh, and the trees and everything, ticks jump onto you and they transmit the virus. So it's not just how is climate affecting these, uh, the pathogen or the vector, it's also how are we responding to it. And we also respond to, uh, uh, to climate. So precipita precipitation is also important. Uh, flooding is one of the main methods through which uh, precipitation affects uh, transmission of pathogens. And this is generally through um, contamination of drinking water. And this is true uh, when you get season, uh, could be seasonal, generally where you have, a, you know, some in India we have a monsoon climate and you get lots of rain during particular times of the year. It could also happen in some place where you just get a tremendous storm at one point and it can oftentimes overload the sewage systems and you get a lot of sewage flowing um, uh, into either kind of in the drinking water, uh, especially if you have uh, certain reservoirs that you've reserved for your drinking water. And of course, uh, a lot of uh, vector-borne diseases, their vectors, like mosquitoes, um, breed in uh, standing water. And if you've got lots of buckets lying around or, um, or something that's unmaintained swimming pools, uh, that precipitation fills up and creates a great habitat for mosquitoes to breed in. And then, so through these events, you can increase the amount of mosquitoes and therefore you increase the number of amount of contact with those mosquitoes and you increase your ability to transmit uh, the pathogen, whether it's a virus um, like dengue or, um, or a parasite like, um, like plasmodium. Humidity is one you won't see as much. I think most of your studies you'll see look at temperature and precipitation. Those are the two variables you see most often. But humidity can also be important, especially in relation to, um, to influenza. So these are two graphs. Um, Jeff Shaman, who's at Columbia, uh, did a study. And he was looking at um, viable influenza virus in comparison to specific humidity. Uh, and then he's looking at the um, percent transmission. I think this was done with mice at different humidities. 
Um, but what you see is that the, as uh, specific humidity tends to um, decrease, we saw a decrease in the survivability of the, of the virus. Um, and this is actually true of the spread of the virus uh, as well. And those obviously would be somewhat correlated. But this is important. So uh, if you have conditions towards uh, higher specific humidity, you generally increase your chance that the, um, uh, that the virus is going to survive. And if it survives in the air long or on surface longer, you increase the probability that someone will come into contact with it and become infected. And humidity is also important for vector survival as well. That's true of ticks, but also mosquitoes. Uh, not only because really dry conditions probably mean you don't have a lot of habitat from the breed in, but just extremely dry conditions are, are not good for mosquitoes as well. So a mosquito won't uh, live very long in a very air-conditioned environment because it's so dry. Wind's not one you think of too much, but it can also affect um, specific pathogens. So if you have a soil-borne pathogen that, uh, that lives beneath the surface, all of a sudden wind conditions can blow a lot of dust around. This is in... Um, I think this is in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. We have a huge, I think so, if you have a huge um, uh, dust storm and it kicks up a lot of that soil uh, and a lot of the, para, uh, sorry, a lot of the bacteria underneath it um, and fungus especially. So there's a fungus called uh, Cuxcidoides which causes valley fever and it's very prominent in this area of the country and it's often associated with um, uh, extremely dry conditions, extremely wind, uh, sorry, um, windy conditions as well. It also has the ability to disperse vectors, and uh, blue tongue virus is a good example of this, um, which is um, transmitted by midges. It can very easily be blown long distances. Um, and here's kind of some of the paths it would take. Some of these are routes um, travel that humans have carried it, or through, um, through kind of shipping or uh, other methods. But there's also some evidence that a lot of them were pushed, um, made it across the Mediterranean because they get high enough in the atmosphere that the wind can um, push them really long distances. This has also been shown in mosquito, um, mosquitoes as well as that particular types of mosquitoes have been shown to be in um, very different places just because they were blown there. So a little bit about El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, this is important because uh, El Nino actually refers to um, water temperature conditions um, in the Pacific. And uh, we generally think of two phases, a warm phase and a cold phase. Um, and you can think in between them as being a neutral phase. And th it's important, you hear so much about El Nino because its effects are, are really worldwide. These maps just show you um, particular things that you tend to see during different phases of El Nino, um, but not only different phases, but also what time of the year they occur. Uh, so for example, you might see um, kind of wetter conditions um, over here during a um, warm episode during kind of that June through August period. Now, when people started doing kind of climate change and climate related health work, one of the big things people did is they correlated everything with El Nino. Everything they could think of, they, there's an El Nino index and they correlated everything with it. Now there's a big problem with this. Uh, first, obviously correlation doesn't equal causation. But also, El Nino is not always a consistent phenomenon. So in a lot of places, uh, you might tend to get warmer conditions during a you know, a warm phase of El Nino. You might tend to, but that might be only six out of 10 times where you get generally warmer conditions than normal or generally wetter conditions than normal. So you're basing your study off of a proxy for something else. So you're saying instead of correlating temperature with this, I'm gonna correlate it with an index that might have something to do with temperature to kind of, um, to calculate my risk of a disease. And this is obviously problematic. The easiest thing to do is just say, well, if you have the temperature already, correlate temperature with your disease. Don't do something that might be a proxy of temperature when you already have a direct measure instead. Now, El Nino is still an important thing to look at because we have some predictive power with it, um, which we don't always do. We don't know it's going to be two months into the future, but we might know that there's, you know, um, El Nino conditions that are, are, are predicted to remain for quite a few months in the future, so we can say maybe two months out it's going to be warmer than normal. So it does have some predictive power, but you have to be really careful how you use it. And of course, climate change is another important um, uh, uh, effect that obviously weather and climate can have on, on vector-borne disease, or sorry, not vector-borne, but just infectious diseases in general. Here's an example of um, um, dengue and showing um, projected uh, risk. Uh, here's, and I think in 2050, I believe this, yeah, it's 2055, and then you see an increase um, in, I think this is 2085, right? Yeah, 20. 
85 over here. And we can see we generally kind of move the borders north in most locations. Um, but some places actually start to decrease. And this is because even, you know, even viruses and mosquitoes have, um, have limits, not only because of temperature, but it might be getting warmer, but you also might be getting drier as well. So oftentimes the ecology is more complicated than simply saying it's going to get warmer, there's going to be more mosquitoes or, or disease, which is generally um, what people commonly think of when they think of, okay, wetter and warmer, it's always going to equal more of a disease. It's not always true. So this is a projection out to 2055, 2055, and this is a projection out to 2085. So they're just using two different um, sets of climate regimes, one from um, uh, a few decades in the future and one to about six or seven. Now, of course, the big problem with going out to 2085 is there's the further you go out into the future, the more uncertainty you have. And so um, I generally don't trust anything more than even 2050, 2060. I think you're really, um, you're kind of really over uh, putting more confidence in those models than you should. Uh, this is the probability, uh, I think it's, yeah, probability of, of dengue occurring in that area. So zero would be that it's definitely not going to occur. One would be it's definitely going to occur in that area. But within this trajectory, how, what's the level of temperature? Will it be increasing or be What they use is, yeah, they use the model, uh, they used temperature data, probably temperature and precipitation data, from a model that makes predictions of what climate will be like from now up until, so this was published, uh, I think only uh, 2015, but from right about now all the way at about 2100. And they looked and they said, okay, this model projects that in you know, 2085, this is what the mean temperatures are going to be. And they put that into their model to predict some kind of probability of so it occurring is there. Is there a possibility that the mosquito is increasing the resistivity within that temperature? That it could increase its resistance? Is yes. that mean? Yeah, oh yeah. So, I mean, this is especially going further out into the future. There's a ton of things that could or could not happen. This is almost assuming that everything's the same. The only thing that changes is temperature and precipitation or, or whatever climate variables they're using, which is obviously a, kind of a dangerous assumption, but um, it's kind of what you have to do. And even these climate change models are based on things like projections of how much CO2 and other greenhouse gases are humans going to produce in the next 20, 40, 50 years. Um, and this is great uncertainty. And usually when they do these studies, and I think they did this, I think there's kind of one uh, uh, kind of graph that I took off of it, is normally when they run these models out, they'll run for a few different scenarios. So one where maybe warming isn't as big, one where warming is a little bit more and, you know, a higher scenario. And they, they do it three times and look at the range of what could occur. Uh, is there, again, possibility to predict that, for example, Zika virus, which is now being hacked in South America, yet it generates, it's a Ugandan virus. Mm -hmm. But you can predict that it is going to appear maybe in China. Um, to actually predict that it's going to appear there, I don't think so. I think there's too much random risk involved. You can calculate the maybe relative risk by saying, you know, here's what the temperature is like here, here are the conditions, are they conducive for the mosquito or not? And if, they, if they're very, you know, good for the mosquito, then you could say, okay, my probability of it occurring there is a little bit higher versus some place where the temperatures are maybe lower and it's not as good for the mosquito. So you can, to some degree, um, evaluate the risk of an area getting the disease, but whether, you know, the right number of people with Zika travel there and, and bring the virus, and whether those people end up getting bit by a mosquito, that's extremely random, and I don't think you can really predict that. Or at least I don't think you can, maybe somebody else does, but um, I wouldn't have very much confidence in saying it's definitely going to happen in this area. I think you can at best say there's this much of a risk of it happening in this area. But my assumption is that once you're using this satellite analysis and you be able to look at their reflections, what is the likely possibility in terms of migration of the movements of organisms, then you can tell you this will be a high risk area or this is middle or low. Yeah. Yeah, so you could say high or low, depending on those things. But remember, then you're only looking at the climate-related risk, too. So another area might be great for the mosquito, but that area might do just absolutely excellent, ve excellent vector control. And so even though the, the area is great for mosquitoes, they, you know, they turn over all their pots, they spray neighborhoods all the time. And so maybe even if the mosquito, mosquito could live there, it actually can't because the humans are doing things. So those things are hard to predict, and that's why you know, while the environment stuff is still challenging, 
the socioeconomic stuff is just even harder to predict because it's, you know, you really can't predict it. You know, you really can't, it's really hard to predict human behavior, which is why basically every economic model is wrong almost all the time. Um, so yeah, I think it's good that we can use it for showing risk and where we need to maybe put control efforts, but it's, you know, I don't think you're ever going to be able to really predict where it exactly it will occur. Good question, though. Mm -hmm. This is actually Culex quinquefasciatus, this is a West Nile virus vector. Sorry, I didn't go over this one. Do they breed in those or those? Uh, they generally are. They're container breeding mosquitoes, so they breed in and around human environments in like buckets and um, unmaintained swimming pools and things of that nature. Um, so this is showing, yeah, that um, uh, they have two scenarios, this kind of baseline mosquito scenario, this is under baseline climate conditions. The dotted line is under future climate conditions. I think this one was done for 2020 to 2030 in the future, around a couple de or a decade or two into the future. It's basically showing you have a slight elongation of the season, so the mosquito season lasts. The population lasts a little bit longer in the fall and starts a little bit earlier in the spring. Um, we do see kind of a dip in the middle. Um, this probably has to do with you actually get decreased precipitation um, in this particular case. Yeah, so you see the, um, see the dotted line, you see a decrease compared to the baseline scenario in the population during these summer months. This is probably the result of this kind of decreasing in precipitation. But we see increase in precipitation on both these sides and increase in temperature, which probably results in kind of this elongation of the season here and here. Does that make sense? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just showing it. So, this blue lines are the change in precipitation. So this is positive, more precipitation compared to um, the baseline condition. And this is less compared to the baseline conditions. Okay. So the black line is the mosquito population under baseline conditions, this solid black line. And when you compare it to the dotted black line, you see that right here, during this time interval, the dotted black line is higher than the solid black line. So under the future, during during this time of the year, especially right here, you see more mosquitoes under the future conditions than under baseline conditions. Well, that's what the model's predicting. Now, when you get to here, you actually see less, right? Now you're seeing less mosquitoes in the future compared to these baseline conditions. And that's partially because you actually see less precipitation during that time as well. So when you have less precipitation, you have less areas for those mosquitoes to breed in. That's basically what it's showing. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I think there is a lag between rainfall and uh, the boom in, in population of mosquitoes. So yeah. Because those are weeds. Yeah. So I think the, the, the graph is okay. Yeah. Well, it's not going to be perfect either because it's not just light on precipitation, it's also on temperature as well. Um, so temperature matters as well. So generally, temperatures are increasing across the area, which during the spring and fall months, when this location happens to be a little bit cooler, that's a good thing. However, during the summer months, having warmer temperatures might not be a good thing. So if your threshold, let's say your ideal temperature for the mosquito survival is 30 degrees Celsius, all of a sudden if it warms, this is about two degrees warming, 32 degrees Celsius might not be as good for the mosquito. So you might get less of them. So it's a combination of both um, development and mortality of this mosquito related to temperature and precipitation versus evaporation too. So the more, um, the higher temperatures you get, you also tend to evaporate um, uh, a lot more water. And because of that, you could get less, um, less habitat for, for the mosquitoes. All right, so here's just, um, these are just general um, kind of events that you would think of that would affect uh, uh, vector-borne, or sorry, uh, I keep saying vector-borne, infectious diseases. You can think about the daily level, things like just a, a weather event, like a storm could cause a lot of flooding, or um, a frost could kill a bunch of a, whether it's a soil fungus or a bunch of the mosquitoes. So daily events can cause things like habit destruction or quick die-offs of, of either a, um, either a vector species or the pathogen itself. I kind of work to the kind of daily to, to, sorry, kind of daily to monthly level. You can think of kind of weather systems. You can think this is a frontal system moving through or something like that or a heat wave. And they're looking more at um, kind of long-term water contamination, uh, really kind of accelerating the life cycle of either a, the pathogen or um, a vector, if it's a vector. And that can increase vulnerability as well. Now, if you move to kind of the seasonal annual, 
scale, you can think of precipitation patterns over a season. So you might have a dry season, a wet season, or you may just have, uh, it might be temperature, you could have a warm season or a cold season, a winter and a summer. And that's obviously going to uh, affect cycles of transmission. So generally you see tick increases at a particular time of the year or mosquitoes increasing at a particular time of the year. And this has to do with seasonal temperature and precipitation patterns. Then you can go further into decadal, and there's an arrow keep going. This could be decadal, century, and so forth. And this has to do with really when you're changing the climate or the ecological limits of, of a particular pathogen um, or disease. And this is kind of what we worry about with um, invasive species and, and, um, and climate change. We can expand the range of a, of a pathogen or, or a vector um, beyond what it normally is. Or you create novel ecologies that we haven't seen yet. I'm not sure. I mean, I guess, yeah, you can go here forever. We can also go here forever as well. You can think of it like a very tiny, tiny scale. Um, and that's really hard to say because even a pathogen within, if you just consider the environment, the human body, you know, pathogens kind of vary quite a bit too. So um, we get resistance to it or the pathogen um, can figure out our immune systems either way. So even that scale might not be completely consistent. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. And obviously, you know, you can go out millennium into the future, and, and when the further out we go with, um, in your temporal scale with climate, the m even more um, variability you get. So I'm not sure any of these things are constant. Uh, I think for short periods of time, it seems constant to us, but um, if you go one way or the other, it's, it's, it's going to become inconsistent again. Um, so when you kind of think of lags for a lot of these things too, so uh, at the disease scale, we usually think of what happened like a few hours to a daily lag as kind of being just noise in our data. And this is because almost nothing is that certain. If we say the incubation period for a virus is seven days, they're almost never going to say the average, they'll say the average is seven days, they're not going to say it's exactly seven days. So it could be eight or nine days, or it could be only five or six days. Um, so there's always going to be noise in your data, and you just have to always kind of, always just accept that. Same thing in your model. At the weekly time scale though, um, you have to think of some kind of lag. So, like I said, if, it's, if it rains today, you can't expect a bunch of mosquitoes tomorrow. You're probably going to have about a week or so lag in there. Um, same thing with incubation periods. If someone, you know, a bunch of people get infected on a specific day because there was a windstorm, so a bunch of people breathed in a particular um, pathogen, um, it's going to take a while for that pathogen to cause disease in those people to become um, um, symptomatic. So, uh, you'll see that as well. Uh, Kind of at the monthly annual level, you could think of like um, seasonally, uh, there would be lags between when you would see, um, like if it's an early spring, it might still be, that early spring might translate into a few weeks or a month earlier of a particular phenomenon. Um, you can't expect it right at that moment. And when you kind of go decadal to climate change, it's, it's uh, kind of the same thing. So a um, species may be able to move into a new area one year because that year is particularly warm, but if the next year is cold, it's probably going to lose its range again. It kind of takes time for a species of um, vector or a pathogen to become um, established in an area. That can take um, years, decades, or, e or even longer. So the thing we have to think about quickly is a uh, spatial scale. So when you're creating a model, what, uh, what kind of data do you need? And what kind of data you need is going to depend on a lot of things, um, particularly what are you creating that model for? You're trying to model what's happening in this particular spot. So this could be like um, for one particular site. You could be thinking, I want to know how many mosquitoes are going to live in this bucket. Well, you have to know kind of the microclimate of that, of that thing. And so at that, that scale, you're talking about vector or pathogen growth or where transmission is going to directly occur. We start going to kind of like the local regional level, uh, like an ecosystem, whether it be like kind of a big wetlands or a forest you're actually thinking of, okay, not just what's happening with the mosquito population right here, but how's the species doing over a wider area. And this is kind of what you need to, fa to uh, facilitate a full transmission cycle. You can't just have a bucket of mosquitoes and say, oh, now there's going to be malaria. You need people around there for the mosquitoes to transmit it back and forth between. And then, of course, at, the very, uh, at a bigger level, when you're kind of th thinking about um, kind of climate zones at a more kind of continental type scale, you got to think about, you can start thinking about metapopulations. So it's possible for malaria to not be incurred in one area, it can be completely gone, 
but that doesn't mean it's always going to stay extinct. It would be, be occurring in the area nearby, and then when conditions become right in that uh, former area again, it can come back there. So metapopulations are important to keep either vector species or pathogens alive in an area when they can't survive year-round. And this is true of something like dengue in South Florida. In South Florida, most of the year, there's no dengue transmission. However, during the summer months, they almost always get a few cases that occur there because people come from other areas um, in the world where dengue um, exists. And when they come there and the mosquito populations are high enough levels, once in a while you get some kind of random local transmission. But you need some kind of metapopulation for that ex to, uh, to occur. So I'm going to quickly, uh, in the last kind of 10 minutes, go through some um, uh, important uh, climate-regulated infectious diseases that uh, you might be studying or you might want to study into the future and, um, and how they're affected by climate. I'm going to break them down to airborne, soilborne, kind of water and foodborne, um, streptomyces, which is really just waterborne, rodent, and then lastly, um, vectorborne. So influenza is a great example of an airborne um, disease that's affected by climate. And the biggest, um, surprisingly, people think of temperature, temperature as being the the reason or the seasonal um, determinant of, of influenza, but it turns out specific humidity is actually the, uh, the, uh, the best predictor of transmission. And here's a paper by um, uh, James Tamarius from the University of Iowa. It's basically showing that in temperate areas, you get a lot of transmission when the specific humidity is um, very low. In tropical areas, you get it when it's very high. And there's kind of two different things processes going on here. This map shows um, um, kind of the peaks and when you get most um, influenza transmission and when they occur. So in the tropical areas you see it, it occurs during humid, uh, rain, the humid rainy season and in the kind of purple, bluish purplish areas it tends to happen during the dry, dry seasons. So humidity is important because uh, as you saw before, humidity uh, increases the survivability of the virus and it also uh, increases the transmissibility of it. However, cold conditions can be important because generally we have colder conditions, it's easier for us to get you know, small cuts and lacerations to our, our throats and everything, our nasal passages, and therefore it's easier, uh, we tend to be more susceptible um, to the virus because of that. Uh, and this is, can be true for uh, uh, other airborne uh, diseases as well. Um, move on to quickly, um, soilborne, uh, this is valley fever, I'll use that as an example, which is um, caused by uh, a fungus uh, coccidiids. Um, generally, the, ki the, um, the symptoms for this are fairly mild. It's generally kind of cough, shortness of breath, um, but it can get quite severe to headaches and joint pain. And once in a while, it's, um, it can be deadly, but this is um, quite rare. And it's caused by breathing in these spores. So what happens is these, um, the um, fungus lives in the soil and it grows there. Once in a while during windy conditions, some of these, uh, these called hyphae will break off. People breathe them in. There's a cycle that occurs in the lungs, which is where it causes disease in humans. Um, and that's kind of the end of the cycle. Humans don't actually put it back out in, into the environment. It's generally um, isolated to um, parts of the southwest US and a few places in um, South America as well. Um, but it's not, uh, doesn't have a very wide range. So this is done by um, Andrew Comrie and some of his colleagues. And they basically came up with this kind of grow and blow hypothesis. And their idea was that you need moist conditions in the soil first to get the, um, the fungus to grow. Then you need it to dry out and you need strong winds to get, that, um, uh, to get the fungus into the air so people can breathe it in and uh, cause disease. Uh, so uh, waterborne foodborne, uh, two very popular, um, I wouldn't say popular, but uh, notorious uh, diseases uh, or pathogens include E. coli and salmonella. Um, a lot of people may have had um, experiences with this, but it's intestinal bacteria causing uh, diarrhea, uh, cramps, and fever. And they're also related to both temperature and precipitation. Here's a graph showing salmonella in, uh, I think this is New Zealand, yeah, cases. And um, generally you can see this is the um, uh, average monthly temperature. Here's the number of seminal cases. In general, you can see that it tends to increase at the warmer temperatures. And then it's, again, it's because the bacteria is able to grow and survive better at warmer temperatures. Here we look at E. coli, and this is actually E. coli levels in the water. And you can see the bottom is the actual uh, number of E. coli uh, uh, spores per milliliter in the water. And it's really very well correlated with the amount of, um, this is flow, so this is flow of um, water. You see that um, 
increases a lot as well. So you see what's probably happening is a lot of precipitation coming down, creating a lot of service flow, washing a lot of, um, um, it could be just um, um, any kind of pathogen or um, bacteria on the surface into the water. And uh, so it increases the chances, chances of someone drinking that water and causing disease. This is similar to um, also for cholera. Cholera is a little different. Um, it's still caused by contamination of food or um, food or water, but there's actually a very um, good relationship between um, climate conditions or actually sea surface temperatures and, um, and cholera. As you can see right here, um, this present cholera in the water and then um, temperature. And it's also affected not just by ocean temperatures, but things like um, the pH of the water uh, and the salinity, because it affects zooplankton, which are important for um, um, uh, keeping or um, for harboring the pathogen. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's not a direct. Well, this is just temperature, too. So, like I said, there's other things uh, affecting it, too, like um, pH, salinity, other things that may, that may have affected over here. It could also be um, at some point, let's, let's see, the sea surface temperatures are going down, but yeah, um, it's lasting a few more weeks. So, it's also possible that people got it and didn't show symptoms for a week or so or didn't get reported at the, at the right time. So, um, I don't know exactly. Um, this is was done at the University, I think, of Wisconsin. Um, but yeah, that's kind of trails at the end, which is important for most diseases. You're almost never going to get an exact um, uh, uh, correlation. So another waterborne, now this is tricky. Some people consider schistosomiasis a vector-borne disease, um, but you could also consider waterborne as well. Um, this is because the, it's a worm, uh, a nematode, uh, it begins its life cycle as eggs in, in the water, usually from human feces or urine. Um, they hatch uh, the um, small worms. They uh, infect snails when they're immature, in their immature stages. They do a life cycle in the snail, then leave the snail, and then they then penetrate through human skin or lacerations in the skin uh, when people are in water and cause disease there. So it's considered vector-borne because the snail is kind of the intermediate host. But you could also think of it as being waterborne because you just have to be in the water for, um, um, to get the pathogen. And so in this case, the snail species is very, um, which is important for the life cycle. If you don't have the snail, it can't complete its life cycle, and therefore the transmission process will be broken. Um, but it's very sensitive to water temperature. And so in this case, warm waters tend to increase the, uh, the probability that you can, um, you'll sustain this infection. So again, um, we've got hantavirus and um, plague. So hantavirus is definitely a rodent-borne disease, but plague you can actually consider as a vector-borne disease because the bacteria that causes it isn't vectored by the necessarily the um, um, the uh, rodent, but actually the uh, fleas on the rodents which uh, carry the bacteria. So Hantavirus pulmonary syndrome is a virus that's transmitted through it can be mouse urine, feces, or um, or saliva. It can be uh, you know very mild conditions, but they can also become uh, very severe. Uh, as well, and, and this did actually cause uh, quite a few deaths in, um, in the southwest par portion of the United States in the, I think it was in the 90s or early 2000s. And then, of course, most everyone knows about plague because uh, of uh, uh, the Black Death in the, in the Middle Ages, but it also exists in many countries throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the world. It's carried, uh, it's caused by the bacteria Eusinius pestis, which is carried by fleas, which those fleas are generally associated with the rodents. And the symptoms can be extremely severe. It's almost universally fatal and happens really quickly. There's an interesting case in the US where a, um, in Arizona where there was a, a zoologist who was tracking mountain lions. And he looked at uh, his scanner and he found out that one of the mountain lions wasn't moving. And so he picked it up. He found out that it had, uh, it had died. It was bleeding from the mouth. He figured it had been attacked by another mountain lion. He brought it back to his, de his de garage and he did a full autopsy of it in his garage with no protective um, gear. A couple days later, he went to the uh, emergency room, or just to, I don't know if it was the emergency room, or just a clinic, and said, hey, I have a cough. And the doctor said, well, let me know if it gets any worse. Two days later, the guy died, because uh, it's very fast moving. And it turned out that the, the uh, mountain lion had actually been uh, infected with um, plague, which it had probably gotten from feeding on um, prairie dogs in the area. So um, I guess that's a lesson, that if you find dead animals, don't pick them up and play with them without some kind of protective gear on. Uh, and so the core climate relationship here is generally people think of as when you get warm spring, uh, sorry, wet spring conditions, or even 
warm too probably helps, but you increase the amount of food for mice, and the more mice you have, the more they tend to explode in population and come into contact with humans. Uh, this could be, you know, just from, you know, living in the walls or around your house and you're cleaning up and you get exposed to their urine or, um, or maybe um, from lice that have jumped off of them. Um, but also from being bit by them too, so uh, hantavirus can also be um, transmitted, like I said, by the um, um, saliva, so if you ever get bit by a mouse, um, it could also transmit it as well. And generally, for hantavirus, it also might be important to have a dry summer too, so it might not be just about having lots of mice, but when you have a drier summer, it's easy to aerosolize a lot of the um, uh, feces and urine that the, um, that the mouse produces. Last thing I'll talk about quickly is vector-borne diseases. So we have um, a lot of diseases that are affected by, um, um, by either ticks or insects. Um, some examples for ticks include Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Babesiosis, uh, Powassan's disease. Ticks have a very, uh, as I showed you before, they have kind of a two-year um, uh, life cycle that they go through, and that can easily be interrupted by um, either an early winter or a more mild winter, which may kind of um, uh, prolong the season or decrease it. Here's kind of a quick map. This is showing um, a model uh, for Lyme disease. Uh, here's kind of your R0. Uh, I remember we, quite a few people talked about that today. Uh, and it's just showing kind of the increase as temperatures warm. This is kind of baseline conditions, which means 1971 to 2000. For a lot of climate models, that's kind of the baseline condition. This is for about uh, 2011 to 2040. So you kind of see this pushward north of the disease and then even further for 2041 to 2070. And they're showing us the conditions get warmer, uh, you have a longer season where, where the, um, the tick species can survive, and therefore you increase the chances of um, transmission. So there's a lot of uh, different um, insect transmitted pathogens for mosquitoes. You have malaria, which is transmitted by Anopheles mosquitoes. Uh, things like dengue fever, chikungunya, and now Zika, transmitted by Aedes mosquito, uh, West Nile virus, um, I, St. Louis encephalitis, Japanese encephalitis, so forth, generally transmitted by um, Culex mosquitoes. And you have a lot of different types of different flies, too, that cause disease. So you have onchocerciasis, which is caused by black flies, um, trypanosomiasis, which is African sleeping sickness, transmitted by tsetse flies. Here's one right here. Uh, Leishmaniasis, transmitted by sand flies. Here's one here. Um, Chagas disease, which is caused by, um, transmitted by trematodes or kissing bugs, right here. And the ecologies of all these uh, types of insects are influenced by climate in one way or the other. Not all the same, they all have their own separate ecologies that you, you have to study. Um, here's an example for um, uh, mosquitoes. You can look at the different types of ways climate can influence the ecology. And kind of at this top level, we look at just some environmental things like precipitation, temperature, and habitat. This level, we're talking about the vector and its development, its survival, and reproduction. And then this lower level, the pathogen, and how the pathogen develops or replicates within the vector, and then the actual transmission of the pathogen. You can look, you can get very complicated dynamics because all of these things can influence the other ones in, in specific ways. So, for example, temperatures can actually increase or decrease survival depending on if they're too high or too low. Um, if the mosquito uh, can't survive very long, then it's not going to survive long enough to um, get the pathogen, allow the pathogen to replicate within its system, and then transmit it to a particular person. But you can think of all types of other pathways too um, precipitation, creating more habitat, more habitat. You have um, uh, more reproduction of the mosquitoes, and it's during that reproductive process when the female takes their blood meal that you're actually transmitting the, um, the virus. So there's many different ways. So by changing one of these things, you're invariably changing the all in some way, sometimes for the better, or sometimes for the worse. So like I said, it's not just warmer is going to equal more. It could increase as part of the transmission cycle, but also decrease other parts of the transmission cycle. And I think that's my last slide. Uh, just some overall conclusions. So if we kind of understand how climate affects um, disease, it provides us the opportunities to simulate, uh, investigate, and predict transmission dynamics. We've got to remember that these are very complex systems, and it requires an interdisciplinary effort. So if you're a mathematical model, oftentimes you have to talk to a biologist. Um, if you're going to include climate and weather in there, you probably want to talk to a climatologist or a meteorologist. Uh, and kind of where we're looking to the future is, is Identifying methods to not just create these models, but to, um, to, trans, um, to put them into operational use. So it's great to have a model that has some prediction, but if, it doesn't, if it's never used or it doesn't incorporate things that make it realistic, it's kind of worthless. Kind of this last thing, which is what some of the climate health people I work with who are epidemiologists often tell me is that 
that's great that you can do all, model all these things, but if you don't have proper surveillance, treatment, and you don't assess these intervention strategies that these models predict, you're not going to be effective in reducing the burden of disease. And so that, I'm finished. Thanks for your attention, everyone. <laughs> Delayed laugh. So we're talking about it's, are things like cancer related to climate yeah, or weather? Yeah, yeah um, I'm not sure. I think to s I think it depends on what kind of cancer. So there are certain cancers that are obviously very related to climate and weather conditions. So obviously skin cancer is a very direct kind of effect. Um, certain viruses can um, can increase particular types of cancers as well. Um, I'm not sure if any of them are vector borne. Um, sometimes these just exasperate something that already happened. So um, people who have cancer who need to go on immunotherapy, um, oftentimes that lowers their immune system because they're getting some kind of radiation treatment that can make you kind of more uh, susceptible to these diseases, especially. Um, but I'm not sure exactly if I could just, if I could, I don't think I can say I would know that climate change is increasing cancer per se. Sometimes the idea of dying from cancer is actually the increased economic status of an area. So if you look at places that die of infectious disease, they tend to be at a lower economic status than places that where people die a lot more from cancer. And it has to do with um, better technology to detect cancer. So you, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, we weren't able to detect a lot of cancer. So people died, but we didn't know what they died from. Now we can say, okay, you died from cancer. So sometimes it seems like more people are dying from cancer, but it's not that they're more dying, it's that now we know that they're dying from it. So that could be the case as well. So I think there's a lot of um, factors. I'm, I don't think I can give you a clear answer, unfortunately, whether, whether climate change is really um, causing increases in cancer or not, I'm though. I'm looking at it to the hypothetical for this program to also develop concerns in that line, and then it is assimilated to the mm -hmm. in the future. It doesn't yeah. Mean yeah, it's definitely room for research on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or climate and disasters affecting healthcare systems. That's an important one, too. Any, no matter where you are, any kind of disaster is going to put stress on your healthcare system, which is going to exasperate any kind of disease, whether it's an infectious disease, cancer, or um, just any kind of chronic disease as well. Yeah, so I've been really interested in um, you know, prediction versus understanding. Mm -hmm. And you, you made some comments about this at the beginning, and then you've given some examples in your talk. And I, I wondered if you wanted to clarify more. Uh, and I'll just tell you what I've experienced, and I, mm -hmm. I want to maybe start a bit of a discussion. That I, I love mechanistic models, and they give insight. But um, when I've tried to apply them to invasive species spread, mm -hmm. like, things like um, pine beetles, often I find um, machine learning models and things like that, where you don't actually put any mechanism in, but you're just asking it to make predictions based on underlying correlations, uh, make a much better predictor in terms of where it will be five years from now. And there's sort of like this dynamic kind of tension mm -hmm. between uh, these beautiful models that give insight and then these other models that you throw in everything plus the kitchen sink. Mm -hmm. They might actually do a good job at prediction. Yeah, that's actually... Uh, an, where do you see yourself on that spectrum? So that's an, actually a comment, and I think it's... Um, I think I'm not against um, empirical models at all, but I think both of them need to be used very smartly. You have to really think about why you're using them and, w and what they're accomplishing. And that's very true. Empirical models are great for short-term prediction, I'll say that, for very short-term prediction, because they're basing what happened in the past, what's going to happen next. And most things, what happens a little bit later from now, are the same as what happened just before that, with a small change. And that's why they're very good at, 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 
at being able to predict these things. They can take so many things into account. Now on a longer time scale, I think that they're not very effective. And that's because one thing about empirical models that's important is when you're seeing unique climates and, and ecologies, which is what climate does, it brings completely new conditions to an area, and you've trained that model on everything that's currently happening, that model can't predict something outside its bounds of past measurements. It's, you know, it's like taking a little kid and measuring them from when they're born up to when they're 14 years old and saying, okay, from there we can predict, use a linear regression, where they're gonna be you know, at age 60. It's gonna be like, oh, you're 14 feet tall. You know what I mean? So, but it would probably work great for like, okay, you know, that kid's four, how tall are they gonna be when they're five, six? It'd probably be really good where a mechanistic model would be really hard to produce. So I think they're both important. I think also statistical models or empirical models can inform what kind of things you really need to look at within a, mechani a mechanistic model. So oftentimes they can say, okay, what am I doing wrong in this, what am I missing this mechanistic model? That, that works in the, in the statistical model too. So I think they inform each other. And I think they need to both be used and inform each other. I don't think we should always rely on just one or the other. As far as predictive process, I think mechanistic models work, are gonna work well in the long term. But empirical models are often good for a first cut, especially for the, for the near future. Especially where there's so much randomness in the process that, that it's gonna be very hard for a mechanistic model to really um, kind of simulate that randomness. Does that make any sense? I know I'm kind of babbling, but. <laughs> Okay, but yeah. It's, it's a challenge. It, there's no doubt it's a challenge. It's one of the things we're always going to have to focus on and how we can bring them together because they both have really important advantages and often very important disadvantages as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, most times, in most African countries, these data are not readily available. Mm -hmm. For example, you talk about this change in temperature. If one would have allowed you to go out and get goes up. You, you can see a trend in the spread of diseases, but obviously we know there is a change in the climate. Mm -hmm. but, but the data are not there to substantiate what we see. So how do we go around this? But, and it's not valid to use data from other crimes mm -hmm. to probably validate what you're saying. So what do you suggest when you start differences? So, um, I'm gonna actually talk a little bit, my next lecture is actually gonna be about, all about climate and, and, um, and weather data and where you can get it from. Um, so the biggest weakness is, I think, not environmental data, it's definitely health data. Health data is sometimes so hard to find, it's so sometimes unreliable and inconsistent. I think really that's your first, like, your first thing that, um, that you, your biggest weakness in this research. And that's exactly one of the weaknesses of empirical models, is if you don't have that data, you can't do, you can do nothing with it. Versus if you have like a mechanistic model and you're fairly confident with it, you can kind of put that environmental data in it. Now in terms of environmental data, we're actually getting a little bit better at it. Um, now weather stations are something that people generally think of when they want weather or climate data. And like you said, the, you don't have those. Sometimes it's either not a climate station. There are costs, you know, $2,000 to get like one year of data or something ridiculous like that. Now what NASA has been working on that's really helped is we have a lot of data sets that are freely available at a global scale all over the world. So things like um, surface temperature, we have um, something called NLDAS, which is the um, National Land Data Simulation Set. And what it does is it, it uses all kinds of observations. And these observations could be if there's weather stays and stuff available. It could be if there's um, this satellite data. And generally, the satellite data is available around the world. And it takes those, and it puts them into a, a kind of a weather forecast model, it's called a reanalysis model because it looks into the past and uses the model in conjunction with the observations to, to give you kind of a record from the past all the way to the future. And that's, I think, available, I think the, the NLDAS data is available, I think at one, I think it's one degree, um, one degree spatial resolution. And that's available, I think, from the 70s all the way up until, I think, the present time, or at least maybe there might be like a one month backlog. So those are kind of the, the best things you can do. Sometimes you need to, um, um, now the model data obviously is important, is going to have some problems because it's modeled, but at least it's available everywhere uniformly all the time. And I think that can kind of help us kind of solve some of that and um, some of that trouble getting the environmental data. Because I, I know what you're talking about. Sometimes you have great health data, but you have nothing to kind of compare it to. So I think that's going to kind of help us into the future. Sorry, do you have a comment on? Can I continue on that? Because uh, my experience is that uh, about environmental data, the temperature is easy to get. Yes. But people I work with tell me that it's impossible to get humidity from satellite data or anything like that. Yeah. And that's why we don't use that in the model, though mm -hmm. we know that it's important. Yes. So we, we built the mosquito model, and we purposely didn't include humidity in it because we knew that most people weren't going to have that data. But humidity is something this free analysis data will have. It'll have, t it'll have surface pressure, um, wind speed, wind, things, you know, almost everything 
they'll have things you haven't even heard of, like you know, 500 millibar pressures. But you know, I mean, things you, if unless you're a meteorologist or a climatologist, you don't care about. But it includes all these things because the the model uh, simulates all these things as well. So that's that's one thing you can start to use those variables that you normally wouldn't be able to use, like humidity, because again, it has humidity. It'll have it. I think it might even have it down to the hourly level, but it has that every single day of the year over the entire surface of the Earth for the last, I think it's, I think it's in the 70s, so for like you know, three or four decades. So I think that will kind of help. Now obviously you need to know, and, and NASA provides all of this free. All NASA data is completely free for anybody, which is, which is actually advantageous over a lot of the space agencies in like Europe where that, where that data costs money. So I think that's going to make it available to a lot more people. As long as you, the biggest problem will be learning how, where to get it and then learning how to download it. You usually need to be able to read net CDF files or sometimes binary files. But once you can do that, you can get it for almost anywhere in the world for whatever time period you want. It's not going to be ideal for every situation, but it'll give you at least a realistic picture of the environment in that area. We usually use uh, uh, IRE data library. What's that? It, IRE uh, data library, data library mm -hmm. from uh, the International Research Institute. So what's kind of, what's the other data you said that they're using? I already, I already, I already. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, it, I think it depends on what, which one's better to use depends on kind of your, your, yeah. your application. I think the IRI data library is just connects to different providers. So it's mm -hmm. more like a hub, it's a portal. Oh, so to get this. you get in there, you can connect to University of Anglia, you can connect to mm. UCB, mm -hmm. different data sources. Yeah, and so the advantage of those, those uh, data sources, they probably oftentimes have cleaned things up for you and make it easier to kind of, yeah. to get them. So um, sometimes it might not be better or worse. Sometimes you might be getting almost the same. Yeah. It's the same thing. So, um, I mean, obviously, if you can get it the most direct route possible, you have the most control over what you do to it. Mm -hmm. So that might be slightly better, but uh, I wouldn't discount the other source if you, you know, I mean, if you're fairly confident in the in the place that that conducted it, that they did the right things with it, and they're providing it in the right format and so forth. Yeah, and sometimes it's just good to get meteorological data or yeah. station data. Then you validate maybe mm -hmm. one data set. Then from there, you're confident enough. Yeah, and that's true. When you use these model data sets, it's usually best to, if you have a station that you can validate against, do that. Um, sometimes you don't, but um, yes. if you can, it's better to do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I will invite you to continue the discussion at the reception. I think it's in the, we have to cross the street to the building on the other side. So we thank the speaker again. Oh, thank you. Yeah.